All right. Hi, everyone. It's 1130 and we're going to go ahead and get started. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd first of all like to introduce the, the people who've helped organize this webinar for everyone. So my name is Jill Bartolotta. I'm an extension educator with Ohio Sea Grant. Then we have Sue Bixler. She's our education specialist for Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory. We have Dr. Chelsea Rockman. She's an assistant professor in ecology at the University of Toronto. And then Christina Dierkes, she's our outreach specialist um, and communication specialist with Ohio Sea Grant. And she's gonna be handling the WebEx logistics uh, for, for this webinar today. So if you have any questions, she has put her contact information in the chat. So if you're having issues right now with logging in, seeing anything, having video, uh, audio, please reach out to Christina and she'll be able to, to help you. So for today, uh, we're gonna be talking about plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. Chelsea is gonna focus really on the issue of plastic pollution in the Great Lakes and science-based solutions. There will be questions after Chelsea's presentation. And then Sue and I are gonna talk about some of the outreach and education that Ohio Sea Grant is doing in order to um, help others prevent their use of plastics. And again, there will be questions uh, after our presentation. We got a lot of questions from everyone. So we've done our best to answer these in the presentations as much as possible. However, if you have further questions, please place your questions um, in the chat box and we will try our best to answer them during the question time. I'm gonna turn it over to Christina right now. If you could just let everyone know how WebEx works. Yes, I will do that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, first of all, let me say we are recording the webinar and we will be um, putting that recording up on the event page on the Ohio Sea Grand website probably early next week. Um, I will put that link in the chat as well. Um, for everyone in just a minute. If you're not currently seeing the chat in your WebEx window, there's a button with a little speech bubble in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. If you click that, you should be able to open the chat window. Um, if you're having any technical trouble, can't hear our speakers, anything like that, please send me a note through that chat as well. Um, if you are have if you have questions for the speakers, that's also where we will um, collect any additional questions that you didn't already put into the registration form. So again, that chat window is your way of talking to us today. Um, all of the attendees are muted. Um, you're in listen only mode. Um, so just in case somebody was wondering about that. Um, if for some reason your audio disconnects, there's an audio and video tab at the top left of your screen that will walk you through reconnecting. If for some reason that doesn't work, it's always good to just close your WebEx window and rejoin us with the link that you used to initially come in. Um, that will fix a wide variety of problems. Um, lastly, I just want to say thank you to the uh, Ohio Technology Consortium, OTEC, for letting us use WebEx. Um, that's been an invaluable tool for the past year. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Jill. All right, thank you, Christina, and thank you so much for your help today with the technology aspect of our webinar. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start off our presentations for the day. So we're really excited to uh, be having uh, Dr. Chelsea Rockman speak for everyone today. She's doing wonderful work every time she presents. I always learn more information. And so it's really exciting. So like I said, she's an assistant professor uh, in ecology at the University of Toronto, and she's the co-founder of the University of Toronto Trash Team. Uh, Chelsea has been researching the sources, sinks, and ecological impl implications of plastic debris in marine and freshwater environments for more than a decade. She has published dozens of scientific papers in respected journals and has led international working groups about plastic pollution. In addition to her research, Chelsea works to translate her science beyond, beyond academia. 
For example, she has presented her work to the United Nations General Assembly and is often called upon to advise the provincial and federal governments on policies related to plastic pollution. Through the University of Toronto trash team, she leads social science efforts that can directly inform local and global mitigation efforts. So Chelsea, I'm gonna hand it over to you if you wanna go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, so much. Can you both see my screen and hear me? Yes, everything looks great, thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, then I'll go ahead and begin. Well, good morning or afternoon, everyone, from wherever you're calling in from. I'm excited to talk today about um, plastic pollution on our Great Lakes. There was a lot of amazing questions that came in. Um, I tried to make sure that I sort of covered things that answered them all, um, but I certainly missed some, and so I'm also excited uh, for the Q&A after. So what I figured I would talk about today is I would start with just a brief introduction about plastic pollution in general and microplastics, just to sort of orient ourselves in uh, the topic we're talking about. And then I will talk specifically about plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. We recently did a um, kind of a general overview for Environment and Climate Change Canada that we submitted to them last month. Um, and so actually I'll share some of the findings from that. And then I will talk about how I think science can inform solutions, walking through one project that really tried to use science to inform solutions and a bit about what we found and kind of what I think the next steps are from there. So I'll start, as I said, with kind of this introduction to, to the plastic, to our subject and I guess leading character of the day. So plastic pollution, or plastic debris in general isn't, well, let's just start with plastic, sorry. Plastic itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? There are some, some valuable aspects of plastic as a material. And certainly when we started to bring plastics on the market, uh, there was a lot of excitement about it. Now, of course, the uses of the plastic that you see here in this picture, we may argue are less sustainable and maybe these single use items aren't the reason why plastics are valuable as a material. Um, but at this time, this is a this is a, a magazine article from Life magazine just after World War II, uh, introducing this idea of plastic as a material and a lot of talk within this article about the single use plastic items that would make our life more convenient talking about specifically that this housewife in this picture can have multiple people over for dinner and simply throw the dishes away at the end of the meal. At this time, we were producing about a half a million tons of plastic per year, uh, but today that the material has really expanded and, and um, grown in terms of the plastic economy, today we produce almost 400 million tons of plastic per year. And the reality is that quite a big percentage of this plastic that we produce, about 40% are for these single use plastic items. So sort of the question we're faced with today is, are we using this material uh, in the most sustainable way possible? And are we really extracting its value or are we maybe using too much of this material or at least not managing it in a sustainable way? So if we look over the years, this was a paper that was published in 2017 by Roland Geyer and colleagues. He's at University of California, Santa Barbara. They, they said that 8,300 million metric tons of plastic has been produced from the beginning of the industry through 2015. Of that, quite a bit is still in use. Remember, we don't throw away all the plastics right away after we use them. They're still locked up in airplanes and uh, clothing and furniture, et cetera. Um, but the amount when we do throw it away, very little of it is recycled. The, recycle econ the cycle, recycling economy is not working. That uh, doesn't mean it can't work, but right now it's not working. Uh, and then there's incineration and we, re we incinerate very little. And some of that is waste to energy in a clean way. And some of it is, is less regulated and less clean. And then you have quite a bit, uh, more than half going out into either landfill or the environment. And so, although we don't know exactly how much is in a contained, engineered, fully engineered landfill versus into the environment, we know that there's a lot of plastic going out into nature. So there's a famous study by Jenna Jambeck that said 8 million metric tons of plastic enters the environment every year. We've since rerun these numbers in a collaboration with Jenna, uh, and we found that in 2020, about 20 to 30 million metric tons of plastic we predict entered into both freshwater and the marine environment. 
And here what we did is we asked the question of, you know, if we want to get back below that 8 million metric tons, how hard do we have to work to do that? But what I want to show you now before I come back to that question of solutions is if we continue business as usual, just how much this trend may increase. Now, of course, the range in this that in this data is huge. And so we may have 36 million tons going into aquatic ecosystems every year or all the way up to 90. So it's clear we have to do something about this. And because of this loss of waste into the system, we know we have global contamination. Now, the oceans get a lot of attention for this, but there's a lot more attention lately being given to freshwater, including here in our Great Lakes. And of course, much of this debris, uh, at least in the ocean, by uh, mass is fishing related large items. But by count, a lot of it are small pieces of microplastic. And I'll show you how much in the Great Lakes is, is fishing debris. Um, that at least we know of so far. So it's a bit a bit of a different story, I think, in freshwater. The other thing I want to remind people of is when we think about microplastics, all of these numbers coming from Donna Jambeck and Roland Geyer and the work that I just showed you, it's all about plastic waste. So how much plastic after we use it goes into the waste stream and how does that get into the environment? When we think about microplastics, it's more than just waste. There are other sources that don't have anything to do with what we put into the, our black, blue, or green bin uh, in the city where we live. And that includes things like uh, microfibers that come off of our clothes when we're washing our clothes or drying our clothes or just wearing our clothes. It includes little bits of tire rubber that come off of our cars. The pre-production plastic pellets produced by industry to make plastic that are sometimes lost from the system. Uh, road paint, for example. So microplastic is a complex beast. So I want to talk a little bit about what it is uh, before I kind of jump into what we know about the science on the small stuff, which is what I'll spend most of my time talking about. So when somebody says the word microplastic, we're actually talking about a really diverse suite of contaminants. And it's many, many different types of polymers because these different polymers are used to make these different products that you see here. They have different chemicals in them in order to make them flexible, stretchy, last longer, give them a color, make them flame retardant. They come in many, many different sizes and they break down over time into more abundant, smaller sizes as they slowly degrade. They come in many different shapes, which can tell us something about the source and which also may be important for toxicity. Um, and they tend to accumulate different contaminants when they're in the environment. So when we ask questions like, are microplastics toxic or what's the source of microplastics? The answer depends, right? And that's something to understand. This is a complex uh, and diverse suite of particles going out into the environment. But I've been researching these particles for, gosh, at this point, more than a decade. And we've learned a ton since then. In 2009, I took my first trip to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and I saw my first microplastic in the middle of the ocean. And at the time, that's what we were thinking about was plastic in the middle of the ocean. As we've learned over the years, it's not just an ocean issue, it's also a freshwater issue, and it's also a terrestrial issue. And in the last few years, some really good work um, from different researchers around the world have shown how microplastics are getting into these important planetary cycles, cycling in the global dust cycle, cycling in the water cycle, uh, even cycling in a food web. And so really, um, this plastic has become quite pervasive. And so the question is, does it matter, right? Is the fact that these plastics are everywhere, how does it impact wildlife? And then of course, people wanna know, how does it impact human health? We extract fish and, and water from the Great Lakes that we uh, consume. Um, and of course, people extract resources from aquatic ecosystems all over the world. So I'll talk to you a bit about that. I am part of a working group right now in California that's basically asked to put a number on how much plastic is too much at what level causes an effect. And for, for the ambient environment, like for wildlife, I think we're getting close to being able to answer this question. For human health, I'll tell you that we know very little. So I'm not gonna focus on human health, but I'm very happy to answer questions later. But a recent study that was led by 
Albert Coleman, and I'm sorry, this is blurry. I didn't realize it last night, uh, but I'll walk you through what this graph really means. And what he's done is he's basically taken all of the studies that have tested the hypotheses about the impacts of plastic debris. So when people in a laboratory have exposed animals to different concentrations of microplastics and asked what concentration causes an effect, he's compiled all of that data and put it into something called a species sensitivity distribution to say at what concentration of plastic does it harm 5% of the species in the environment? And so that is the orange line here, is the concentration of plastic that can cause an effect. And so you can see here, it's just under about 100 particles per liter. And that number of course varies, but this is about the median value. Then he says, okay, if I plot all of the amounts of plastic in the environment, are there any environments out there that have higher than this hazard concentration that harms 5% of the species? And the answer is that there are, but there's not a ton. And I'll show you what it looks like for the Great Lakes later, because we've done this here in the Great Lakes, because this, these are freshwater concentrations. So we can use the work of Bart Coleman's in order to answer these questions. So what I take home from this is that microplastics can have an effect on organisms, and we certainly know big plastics can. The good news is we haven't gotten to a point yet where ecosystems across the world are contaminated to a level that we're causing great harm. But if we continue business as usual as might, so we absolutely have to start getting to know the science better and using it to inform solutions, which is why it's exciting to speak to an audience like this, because I'm talking to a lot of people who are interested in the question of what can we do about it. So I'm going to talk now about plastic in the Great Lakes to let us know what we know and then think a bit about with that information, what might, what might need we do? So some of what I'm gonna show you is published data in the literature. Some of it is from community and citizen science efforts. And some of it, as I said, comes from this report that we turned into ECCC like a week and a half ago. So it's kind of hot off the press and it's, it's a report uh, taking information from the scientific literature to inform whether we are ready and we know enough to consider plastic pollution as an indicator for uh, ecosystem health in the Great Lakes. And that in Canada is under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So the first thing, when we started earlier, I talked about Jenna's number, 8 million metric tons of plastic going into the ocean, updated in a working group that was led by Stephanie Burrell, who is working in my lab, says now we think there's you know 20 plus million tons of, of plastic going into aquatic ecosystems. Well, Matthew Hoffman, who's a professor at RIT, and his student tried to say, well, how much is going into the Great Lakes? And from data, I think from 2010, so this number again would be updated, he suggests and predicts, estimates, that 10,000 tons of plastic enter the Great Lakes annually. Now, from those of us that are going out and doing cleanups around the lakes, we know that we see this material, so it's not a huge surprise. And here's just a graph of what the community science and citizen science, and actually a lot of this is cleanup data, uh, what this looks like. So I'm just going to start by talking about the big plastic um, and where that is around the lake. And first of all, uh, there is no, I think this was a question, there is no current uh, regular monitoring program for large or small plastic pollution on the Great Lakes. I cannot find any within the United States or within Canada. There are some informal programs, and I wouldn't even call them monitoring programs, but for example, the Ministry of the Environment in Ontario has done some sampling of microplastics to inform, again, whether a, a real monitoring strategy is needed. So a lot of the data I'm going to show you comes from community science or comes from the peer reviewed literature. So here, what you're just looking at is the amount of plastic that's been picked up in different places around the Great Lakes from people who have gone out and done cleanups. But this is still really important information that can tell us something. And we use the International Coastal Cleanup data a lot in our lab. So if you are doing cleanups around the Great Lakes, please, please, please submit your data through the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup or the International Coastal Cleanup. Even if you're submitting through your own group, at least make sure that it also gets logged there. And often it's not double counted. It's uh, like, for example, in Canada, we submit it to Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup and they submit it to the ICC database for us. So one really useful piece of information we get from this is what types of materials are we finding and how can that inform solution? So for example, if we look across everything that we see within the different lakes, we can see how much is small trash, how much is smoking related, how much is single use plastics. This is certainly something people are interested in 
It's informing legislation right now here in Canada. So if we just look at these light orange bars of single use plastic and see what it is, we can see what items pop up as the most common. And these are informing part of what Canada is proposing to ban um, this year, right? So this information can be quite important. Then there was a question about fishing debris. We had the same question, uh, how much, you know, we know in the ocean it's A, it's really common by mass and B, it's really known to cause harm to wildlife through entanglement and sometimes ingestion, but mostly entanglement. We also know that it can cause be a correlative of disease in coral reefs. We know there's fisheries on the Great Lakes, both recreational and commercial. So we wanted to know how much do we know about fishing debris on the Great Lakes? Well, the reality is very little. There's nothing in the scientific literature. There is tiny, tiny band of fishing debris here. It's like that green color and here's what it is. Fishing buoys, pots and traps, fishing line. Um, but again, we see no evidence of what's in the water. So for me, this just says, wow, we really need to, we really need to know more. And I know that uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is teaming up with the Triple GI, the Global Glow Scare Initiative, to try to understand how much of an issue this is in our Great Lakes. So that's macroplastic. We know it's there. We have some data that we can use, but we really do need a formal monitoring program. And for that, I would suggest um, using maybe the NOAA's Marine Debris Protocol and doing assessments regularly. Then we wanted to see, well, how much do we know about microplastic, which a lot of you asked about in your questions as well. There's a lot of, of concern over how much is there and does it how, how much does it matter? Does it impact the wildlife? Does it impact humans? So all you're looking at here, um, you can see where there's a few pieces of literature on big plastic and it tends to be smaller big plastic. But most of these just tell you the number of studies and the type of sample they were taking within each of the lake and the darker of the lake you have more studies. So there's been quite a bit done in Lake Ontario, some work done in Superior and, and Michigan and Erie, and actually the least done in Lake Huron, uh, at least in the published literature. So now what I'm going to show you is basically what are the concentrations? What are we seeing? Now, these numbers are just going to look like a bunch of dots on a plot. Uh, you're welcome to snap pictures of them. I really don't mind, but I will talk a bit later about what that kind of means uh, because otherwise they're just dots on a plot. Um, but it's still useful to have this information. So here you can see the abundance of uh, microplastics in each lake in surface water. So and it also includes tributaries. Now, I think tributaries are important to consider as an ecosystem feeding into the Great Lakes. Some people look at it as a pipeline, as a source into the Great Lakes. However you wanna look at it is okay, um, but the reason I think it's important to see it as an ecosystem is that some of the species that live in the Great Lakes use the tributaries in a really important part of their life stage. And the other reason is that um, if we don't treat it as an ecosystem, the concentrations that are in there get completely ignored under a risk assessment. And we're deciding that we don't care so much about what's in the rivers as we do in the lakes. So that's why they're here, but they also make it really hard to see the concentrations here because they tend to be higher values because they're a bit less dilute and the plastic tends to be coming from the land down the tributaries and into the lakes. So here down below, we've taken those tributaries away and you can see the concentrations. So these are uh, concentrations per meter squared, so per thousands of liters of water. So you can see the concentrations aren't crazy high, um, but we do have certainly microplastics in all of our Great Lakes. And we also did the same thing with sediment. So again, here you can see how much is in each lake, as well as the tributaries, and then also which where the tributaries are and how it differs between near shore and offshore. Again, these are just numbers on a plot to show you that we do have microplastics in the samples that we're looking for. Again, there's no formal monitoring program, but if we had a formal monitoring program, we could certainly use these values in order to inform mitigation and potentially use them in a risk assessment framework. So now a question a lot of people wanted to know is, well, are they getting into our wildlife? So there's certainly data on that, but not a lot. Compared to the ocean, we know a lot less about which species in our Great Lakes have been reported to have microplastic in them. So you can see here the different bird species and the lakes that they've been reported in, the different fish species. And then somebody particularly asked about mussels. There's very little data about how much microplastic is in mussels in the Great Lakes. 
There's a group at University of Michigan, I think, interested in tackling this question a bit more to see if they filter out the microplastic and also how it impacts them. But at the moment, all we know is that mussels certainly ingest microplastics. We see this beyond the Great Lakes. Um, but we don't know too much about how this impacts our own system. One of the things that really fascinates me, though, is I started my career, as I said, in the middle of the ocean, and I was on a research vessel where we were quantifying microplastics in fish from the middle of the North, North Pacific uh, gyre. And we found microplastic in about 1 in 10, 1 in 11 fish, and maybe a few pieces per individual. Here, I just want to show you some unpublished data that's currently in its third round of revision uh, with, with conservation biology, so it should be out soon. Uh, looking at microplastics in different species of fish from Lake Ontario. This was the first study where we found microplastic in every single fish we looked in. And it was also the first study where I found more, well, my student led this at the time. So Keenan Muno is a, a research technician in my lab and also our lab manager. She was a master's student at the time when she was working on this. She found more than 100 particles of plastic in each individual fish. Not all, of course, some fish had less, but I found that really striking. So that really suggests to me, you know, here at home in our Great Lakes, and these are in the Toronto Harbor, where we certainly near a city, you have higher concentrations. I think it's pretty important for us to think about how that may be impacting our fish. And some of these are sport fish. So also how that is relevant to human exposure. So that kind of brings about the question of uh, what are the effects to freshwater organisms? So I just showed you that plot from Bart Coleman's and I'll actually show that again and then I'll show you a version for the Great Lakes. Um, but first I wanna show you a little bit about what we know uh, about effects and what data is kind of feeding into that. So the next plot I'm gonna show you, I'll walk you through what it is. But basically we look across the literature where somebody has looked for an effect of microplastic in a freshwater organism. And we ask what level of biological organization did they look in? Did they see whether it impacted the population, like maybe it harmed reproduction? Did it actually kill the organism? Or instead, did it cause a lesion in a tissue or cause cell death, or maybe change gene expression or oxidative stress. So we're asking these questions suborganismal and then more ecologically relevant. And then what size of plastic? The first thing that's striking is that if I show you this plot for the marine environment, there's so much more over here because a lot of people have reported effects in marine organisms from macroplastic, where we know virtually nothing from freshwater. So it's a big gap, this question of fishing debris and, and whether or not it matters here for ecological effect. So you'll notice most of it is microplastic. Now you can see that there's certainly effects detected across many levels of biological organization. But here this means that they, they had some concentrations of microplastic in their study where they didn't detect an effect. And this is expected. We often you know, expose animals to different concentrations to say what concentration is too much. Um, but it's a bit more than that. Sometimes the type of plastic also matters, um, the size of the plastic, et cetera. So microplastics certainly can have an effect, but of course, not all concentrations, you know, the dose makes the poison and the type of plastic also matters. So again, we come back here to looking at this hazard concentration when you have this mixture of plastic and what do we predict from that mixture of plastic in the environment causes an effect. So let's do this same thing for the Great Lakes. So we did this recently. And so here you can see each lake plotted as a different color. And you can see the concentration that causes five, per, that harms 5% of the species and the concentration that harms 1% of the species. If you get into this between one and five, we think it's really important that you start a formal monitoring program and maybe start to think about what mitigation strategies are so we don't get into a concentration where you have 5% of the species affected. Now what you can see here is that for most lakes, we're pretty far from those values. But for Michigan and Ontario, there are some samples that have been taken, not all, right, just some, where you get into that fair and just one in the poor. So the question here is, okay, I think it's time to start to think about a monitoring program for our Great Lakes and maybe think about how we use that in a risk assessment framework um, in order to inform mitigation strategy. So that's kind of my overview on plastics in the Great Lakes. And I was going to spend the rest of my time talking a bit about how science can inform solutions. So I think the most important way to keep plastic from affecting our Great Lakes is to keep it out of our Great Lakes 
I don't think anyone disagrees with that statement. There's many different ways to keep it out of our Great Lakes, but I think focusing on the sources and the pathways are really important ways to prevent it. And then, of course, there's cleanup, uh, which is some of the work that Jill will probably talk about later. And of course, the international coastal cleanup data I showed. But if we keep it out of the lake, that's the most surefire way. So one, you can target certain products. You see, for example, Canada thinking about getting rid of some single use plastics. You can target some, uh, you can have some maybe solutions that say we'll pay fishers to uh, pick up fishing gear. But you can also target the pathways because microplastics are entering the environment through stormwater and wastewater treatment plant affluent agricultural runoff. I'm not quite sure how you'd prevent it in the wind, right? But these pathways are important to think about. So what we did recently is we did a study to say, how do microplastics get into aquatic ecosystems? Just targeting three different uh, pathways. We could have picked others, we picked three. And we looked across many different watersheds to see how consistently were they a source and how consistently was one a larger source than the other? Because governments don't have all the money and resources in the world, and so instead they're probably going to prioritize. So we wanted to say, what are the trends across geographies? So we did do some work in the Great Lakes uh, here in Lake Ontario uh, in Toronto. We also worked in the Sacramento Bay Delta just up above San Francisco. We did some work in San Francisco too, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, Mississippi River and then also Chesapeake Bay. So not all freshwater, not all Great Lakes, but it's relevant because the purpose is how local does mitigation need to be and how important are these different pathways. So within each one of these locations, we sampled uh, wastewater, we sampled stormwater runoff, we sampled uh, agricultural runoff, we quantified and characterized the microplastics in them and saw how they compare within a site and how they compare across the four sites. So I'm going to show you graphs first of just the concentrations of anthropogenic particles. So it includes microfibers that are made out of like, for example, my shirt is cotton, but we see this kind of like cotton microfiber material in the environment as well. So first you just see the concentrations in the water bodies down below have a lower, lower concentration of plastic. That's no surprise. And uh, the pathways you would expect to have more in them, bringing them to the environment and then diluting in the lake. So what really I want you to focus on is this chart here, where you can see for the difference between agriculture, stormwater, and wastewater, and each color is a different geography. And what you see here is that for the Sacramento Bay Delta, agriculture tends to be the largest source. You can compare here to the other reds, the other Sacramento across the pathways. When you look at Lake Ontario, you see that stormwater is actually larger, but maybe not significantly from wastewater. And ag is kind of a small source. And you can see for Chesapeake Bay, they almost look equal, which suggests that if you have to prioritize something, uh, each region has a different and unique largest pathway. Now, how else are the pathways unique? We wanted to understand whether or not there were different signatures of types of plastics within these different pathways to inform upstream mitigation or to help us monitor if we're sampling downstream only and we see certain types of particles, can we attribute it to a pathway that we can do mitigation in? So here, we didn't do it by the type of polymer because let me just tell you that a sample is diverse and there's so many different particles and you really can't uh, very easily tell um, the difference between sites from the types of polymers. It's, there's just too many and there's no trend. What we did instead is we looked for black rubbery particles looking like tire dust, different fibers which come from textiles, uh, foam and film and fragments which often come from single use products but are different plastic products that break down in the environment. And then some different things that we seem to be typical with uh, wastewater and then also this glass is actually gypsum which is used in agriculture. So here you can see the black rubbery fragments, this dark red, are pretty common in stormwater always and sometimes present in agriculture. You can see that fibers are very, very common in wastewater, although they're common across the board, but they tend to be sort of the signature in wastewater. And then you can also see in some cases for agriculture, you have this gypsum signature. And so maybe we can use this information to help us understand which pathways are important. And we've seen the exact same thing in the San Francisco Bay, where stormwater was a much bigger source of microplastic into the system, much, much bigger, but that the, for the wastewater treatment plant, more than 50% of what we saw were fibers, 
And for the stormwater, more than 50% of what we saw were these black rubbery particles. So again, understanding the pathways can help you inform mitigation. So what I want you to take from that, and then we'll talk about solutions as I wrap up, is that there's a lot of different pathways bringing microplastics into the environment. It's not just mismanaged waste. And these pathways vary by locations. And so unfortunately, because of this, but maybe this isn't unfortunate, but it's just that we can't use what we see in one location to necessarily make us inform what we do in another. So local monitoring seems really important here. Different pathways have different microplastic signatures, which could be used in monitoring. Maybe we don't have to start by going into each pathway. We start by sampling downstream based on what we see, we explore further. Um, and so I think these can really inform what we do. So let's talk a bit about what we do for the issue of plastic pollution in general. And there's no silver bullet solution, as I think you all know. And I think a lot of different solutions have to be tugged on at the same time. When it comes to mismanaged waste, which I showed you before, we have a lot of work to do to get from here to here. And I don't think there's one thing that we're going to turn on tomorrow and get there. Because if we did, and we sort of did this assessment, if we just reduced plastic waste, if we just increased waste management, and if we just cleaned up, the amount we have to do is tremendous. So really the solution is we need to do all of these things at the same time. Here, single-use plastic bans are part of reducing plastic waste. So is it building a circular economy to keep it out of the waste stream. Increasing waste management, meaning collections at houses so that it doesn't go out into the environment. Not necessarily how, I mean, and also like if, if you are going to keep it in a landfill, having it engineered. But if it's a circular economy and it's recycling, we actually had it in this bin. And then you have cleanup. But remember that for microplastics, these types of things are not as, they're not going to solve the whole issue. So I also wanted to talk just a little bit in the last minute or so on some of the solutions I see that are important for microplastics, because I think as we do these big things about plastic waste, great. We also should think a bit about what we can do for the smaller stuff. So first of all, stormwater. Stormwater is a big source. In order to trap and keep contaminants, chemical contaminants out of a system, sometimes bioretention cells or rain gardens are used where the water runs off the road, goes through a garden, filters out the soils, attach, you know, can, attracts the contaminants and cleaner water goes into the system. In this case, it's the San Francisco Bay. Here we have samples of how much plastic was in stormwater and it's a lot. And then we took samples of the influent going in and the effluent coming out. And you can see a big reduction, particularly here. And basically we saw that about 80 to 90% of the plastic coming in was removed from the system by the bioretention cell. So that's something we can consider for stormwater, that's permeable pavements, rain gardens, bioretention cells. Uh, there's different flavors of these. When it comes to microfibers and wastewater treatment plants, we feel strongly that filters on washing machines work. We have a lint trap in our dryer that traps the lint in that system. We're very used to cleaning it out and putting it in the garbage bin. A filter on a washing machine is identical, except for now it's a bit wet and yucky, but you can still take it out and put it into the trash. In a laboratory, we see that the amount of microfibers in a single wash without any microplastic we, we can quantify that amount, and if we are sorry, not without any microplastic, without any filter, and if we add a filter, we see a huge reduction from no filter to filter. And we've recently put uh, filters, and this is in collaboration with Georgian Bay Forever, into 100 homes in Perry Sound around Lake Huron, and we saw a significant um, difference at the wastewater treatment plant scale, suggesting that even at a community level, if you have enough filters and washing machines, you see less going out into the environment. So that's really exciting for us. And there are bills, there's one in Kingston, Ontario, and then there's one in California that suggests washing machines should be, when we make new ones, we should be putting filters in them. And I 100% agree. And then of course there's trash trapping, which is one of our new favorite solutions because it's really good in terms of it uh, certainly captures the public attention. There's nothing better than trash wheel googly eyes in Baltimore, um, but even having booms or having sea bins can certainly uh, help capture both big plastic and small plastic. And there's a lot of different flavors of trash capture devices, devices or trash traps. And the reason I think these are so great is because I think cleanup, unfortunately, 
we're going to still need it until we get to a place where we can actually prevent plastic from going out into the environment. And while people going out and doing beach cleans are great, they raise awareness, they certainly clean. We can't do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but machines can. And they also increase awareness and the community, if you make them fun, loves them and learns a lot from them. They also collect data because again, remember that international coastal cleanup data tells us something about sources and so does what lands at what lands in a trash trap. So we've recently launched a trash trap network, the international trash trap network that's in collaboration with ocean conservancy that's under the umbrella of the international coastal cleanup. We wanted to do it within a system that already existed. And the idea is that now you have people cleaning on land through their beach cleans. They already have project aware, which is people cleaning underwater diving. That data goes into the international coastal cleanup. Now we're trying to capture all the trash trap data around the world into the international coastal cleanup to be able to quantify exactly what our impact is both locally and globally to inform mitigation and also to say, how much effort are we doing? How are we helping move that needle uh, below that 8 million metric tons? And so with that, I just think there's many of these different ways, right? Where we can act really locally, but we're helping solve this global problem and basically the goal we all have. So I think I kept on time. And so hopefully we still have some time uh, for questions as planned. Thank you so much for listening. I'm excited to hear from all of you. Thank you so much, Chelsea. That was wonderful. Yes, we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions and they've been coming in through the chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and start asking questions if that's okay. And mm -hmm. just so everyone knows, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. If you can send them to everyone, that would be great because then that means I can see them. Also, as Chelsea was mentioning some of the trash removal technology at the microplastic level, but then also in the water. I've been putting links in the chat if you want to uh, save those resources for, for later use. So here's a quick question. You mentioned a waste logging program. I think the person was asking about the International Coastal Cleanup unless I missed something. Is that correct? Are you asking me or the person? Yeah, Chelsea. Yeah, I'm asking you, Chelsea. You mentioned a waste logging program. Oh, I'm guessing it is the International Coastal Cleanup. Yeah, so the International Coastal Cleanup right now has a the Clean Swell app, but they also have data uh, data cards. And so basically, when you're doing beach cleanups, um, people sh should, well, in my opinion, submit their data so that we know how much is being cleaned up, what's being cleaned up. Um, but for trash trapping, we're also starting to submit data through that same database so that around the world, we can say how much we're collecting. So that's the out in the environment. If they're talking about how we had the data to estimate how much mismanaged waste goes in the world, that comes from the World Bank data set. Okay. So yeah. the International Coastal Cleanup, and I put that link in the chat, and then the World Bank data set. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So someone asked a question about mushrooms and how mushrooms or fungi can be used to digest plastics. What is the scientific opinion on this type of technology? I guess you could say also, is it something that's being looked at in the Great Lakes? So I think what I'm guessing that question is about is that I think some people have used mushrooms and fungi to make uh, biodegradable uh, plastic. So there's definitely a lot of people, right? As we think about how do we, how do we make, how do we keep plastics in a closed loop, right? So either we reuse and we reduce and we recycle mechanically, or for some products that are really hard to do that, do we need to make things that are truly compostable or biodegradable? And for that, people are looking to technologies like creating plastic out of out of mushrooms and fungus, uh, creating them out of marine microbes, and then. The idea is that if they're made out of these things, they can be broken down uh, within a food web, within the microbial community and the environment. They are being considered around the world. Um, how specific it is to our area, I don't know. Um, and I'm not an expert in it, but I am certainly intrigued by the idea because there are some items that are, are pretty hard to, to manage sustainably. Awesome, thank you. Um, so looking at the trash wheel, 
So I put that link in the chat as well, but it's it's basically this large wheel that they have in several locations in Baltimore and other countries as well. Has there been any discussions about getting a trash wheel in the Great Lakes? There has been discussion. Uh, so we actually tried really hard to get one in Toronto. Uh, we ended up with Siemens because there's been a lot of work on the Don River and it's just not the time to put a trash wheel in place. Um, but we got as far as having a design, having a quote. Um, outside of our area, I don't know yet, but I mean, there certainly could be. They're wonderful piece of technology. They're great for the end of rivers. Um, so I highly recommend, I don't have a favorite trash trapping device, but Mr. Trash Wheel certainly what got me excited about it. So I would love to see one in the Great Lakes. I agree. I I love them as well. And and just for some information on the US side of the Great Lakes, we do not have a trash wheel in the Great Lakes. Um, there are some large cities, for example, Cleveland, we have boats that do debris cleanup, um, but it is, you know, manually going out there with nets or, you know, hooks and stuff like that, pulling out not only the large woody debris, but also plastic and other trash items as, as well. But it is something that Sea Grant marinas, EPA, no marine debris program, a lot of other partners were really starting to look more at trash tra trash trapping technology in the Great Lakes, the US side of the Great Lakes. Uh, so Chelsea, there's been a lot of questions on the removal of the microfibers in the washing machine process. So some people are asking questions. Um, what is more efficient, Cora Ball, the guppy bags versus a machine filter? Can you buy a machine filter? What happens if you're on septic? How does that work? So if you could talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have not tested the guppy friend. Um, we did test the Cora Ball. The, 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 Aftermarket filters or a filter in a washing machine, they work the best. Um, and it just makes sense. They're taking the water and they're filtering it before it goes out into the wastewater treatment plant. Um, you can buy them. You can buy them on Amazon. There's a brand called the Filtrol. There's another one called the Lint Lover. Lint Lover is maybe not on Amazon. It's a Canadian brand. Um, they were actually invented first for septic because they were trying to help people keep things out of their septic tank. And then the microfiber issue arose and uh, Mark Brown, who kind of first realized like, oh, maybe this is coming from washing machines, suggested these these filters that were being used for septic. So the tricky part is, I mean, ideally, eventually washing machine manufacturers are putting them in and we don't have to buy them. But so for me, for example, I'd love to have a washing machine filter at home, but my washing machine is pushed back into my wall and I would have to go into my wall to install it. So that's where you might choose a Cora Ball or a Guppy Friend or something else if you can't install the thing. But they're pretty easy to maintain. We've got them in 97 homes in Perry Sound and only two people said they would, they do not want to keep it after the study. Everyone else is happy with them, thinks they're easy, wants to continue. That's awesome. And I'm thinking of getting one for my washing machine. I just need to do it. I currently use the Cora Ball, but I would like something that is more effective at removing those microfibers. So a uh, question about when you were doing your study on plastics coming from agriculture versus wastewater, how do you know where it comes from if it's coming out of the same watershed? Oh, excellent question. Um, I should have made that more clear. Uh, for the wastewater treatment plant, which this person didn't ask because they, they might realize, we went to the plant and we sampled the final effluent like coming out of the tap. For agricultural runoff and urban storm, stormwater runoff, we chose to sample from locations where 75% of the land use above where we sampled was either agriculture. So we were sampling kind of like right where all of the agricultural runoff sort of comes into the stream or surrounded by urban area and tons of roads and um, and so that's how we how we made that decision. So we yes, correct. It is within all the same watershed, but different tributaries and locations where we could figure that out. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Um, this question is we're switching gears now, but it sounds like there might be some research looking at plastic for fuel. Mm -hmm. Have you heard? I've not heard anything about this. So have you heard anything about this? I have heard about it. I'm not an expert, um, but there are, I don't know how much this has come to scale, 
uh, yet, but there is technology that can take plastic and bring it bring it back down into fuel. Um, the other type of like new technology on the market is chemical recycling, which can take plastic down to its original molecules and remake plastic in a way that's different from a mechanical recycling, which is just literally like clean it, break it down, melt it, remake it. I don't know a ton about either of these technologies and what it will take to get them to scale and the trade-offs, but there's they're all coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Excellent. I'm always learning something new in the world of plastics. I feel like the information is changing or being updated every day. So it's very <laughs> exciting. So here's another question. I I'll let you provide an answer, but I have an answer for the US as well. But what is the impact to tourism? when you have beaches or say swimming or paddling areas that are littered with trash and how could that possibly affect the economy yeah so there is a dollar amount put on that i don't know it off the top of my head i was involved in a um international working group led by gazamp uh, and it's like a a un body affiliation where they bring people together and we had economists working in the group and they put value a dollar value on how it impacts tourism as well as um how it impacts our psychology when we try to go to a beautiful pristine system and there's litter everywhere. Um, so I don't have the value. And so Jill, I'm interested to hear what you have to say, but it certainly does cause an impact. Yes, yeah, so everyone, I just put a link to the study in the chat, but so the NOAA Marine Debris Program, they're going to be our federal organization that manages marine debris for us in the United States, but they also work frequently with uh, it's the Canadian version of NOAA, the Environment Climate Change Canada. I know you just changed your name. <laughs> yeah, and we Environment Climate Change Canada and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, we're all working together, but they did a study in four regions across the country. Ohio was actually the Great Lakes state that was chosen for that study. And they found that clean beaches can boost um, tourism, you know, in the millions and millions of dollars. But the reverse of that is dirty beaches can reduce tourism and the dollars spent in a community and the jobs related to tourism by millions and millions of dollars. And they've looked at this in, in California pretty extensively. So it's it's a millions of dollar impact. And then what goes along with that is gonna be the cleanup associated with these items. So locally, I've spoken with beach managers and in our area in Cleveland, beach managers spend tens of thousands of dollars a year cleaning beaches. Yes, they're removing that woody debris, even though it is important for the system, but they're also removing a lot of trash from that as well. And there was a study done out in California on how much it takes per person to manage trash, and it's pretty expensive. I'll try to find the, the California study mm -hmm. too. So yes, plastic and trash does have a huge impact on tourism economies, not just for us here in North America, but all over the world. All right, I'm trying to look through. Yes, okay, here's a great question. So this is a big issue and it can seem daunting at times. So what you know, words of encouragement do you have to people that want to start being more involved or want to make behavior changes in their individual lives? What can they do? And we'll, I think, end with that question. Okay. Yeah, it's a really good question and I teach, right? So I, and I teach a class called the ecosystems and the human footprint. So when you talk about the human footprint, you can really be, be really overwhelmed, right? About all the environmental issues, but we also have to remember that individual actions, even if they're at the corporate, the government level, each small step that was taken led us to where we are. So every small step backs us out of where we are. So we can all make a difference at every level. I strongly believe that. Um, and so I think every little bit counts. And so there's different things we can do in our life, right? If we want to make individual behavior changes, we can reduce the amount of um, plastic that we use that's going to go to landfill. So we can we can reduce what we use, we can reuse the products we do use, and we can also go to the, the store and become waste literate in our own community and try to buy the materials that can go in a, in a recycle bin or in a green bin and truly be um, put into that circular economy. I think education is important. If you go tell a few friends, right, they also might make a difference. If we want to make a 
difference at a larger level, right? At the corporate level or at the government level. Again, like what we buy, what we do, corporations, they do, you know, we are their customers. So that is important, but also writing letters, writing letters to politicians. We do have a voice. They, we are their constituents. We vote. Uh, so definitely, I just, I think there's so many little things we can do. I, when I first started researching this issue 10 years ago, people were like, what are you talking about? Obviously for big plastic, we knew, right? There was already work being done for the small stuff. Um, the industry wasn't really ready to listen yet. Uh, the government was just not here yet. Researchers weren't thinking about it. And I've seen a huge shift, right? So even though it seems big and intractable, um, I've already seen signs of progress and progress, right? So the microbead bill, which happened a couple years ago, we don't see as many microbeads in Lake Ontario anymore. It does make a difference. So I guess I'll just end on that is like, try to be, be positive and have hope and think about the things you can do in your life and know that they count. All right, thank you. And that's a great segue into what Sue and I will be talking about. Sue will be ending her presentation with some very specific examples of basically where you can start on this, you know, whole plastics reduction journey. So I just want to say thank you so much, Chelsea, for joining us today. Um, if you have further questions for Chelsea, her contact information was placed in the chat. Also, Chelsea, are you willing to share slides with us so that we could send those out to participants? All right. So, yes, there will be a recording, but there will also be slides sent out, and that should go out in an email sometimes next week. So, we're going to segue now into Sue and I's presentation. So, thank you again so much, Chelsea. We appreciate all the information. Thank you. I'm going to pull up my presentation. All right, so Sue or Christina, can you please let me know if you can see and hear me? Everything, Everything. looks good. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, so my name's Jill Bartolotta and I'm gonna really talk today about some prevention strategies that Ohio Sea Grant is looking at just to reduce plastics from getting in to the Great Lakes. And the items we're gonna be focusing on today are going to be straws and then bags. And then when Sue begins her presentation, she's really gonna provide some of the individual solutions that you can take in your everyday lives to phase out plastics or reduce the amount of plastics in our freshwater environments. All right, so really quickly, I just wanna introduce Ohio Sea Grant. We are one of 33 programs around the United States and in US territories. We are federally funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And then each Sea Grant program is housed in the um, university within the state. So for us, it's gonna be the Ohio State University. And through outreach, education, and research, we work with coastal communities to address their most pressing and emerging um, natural resource tourism, economic issues. And then Sue will introduce Stone Lab when she begins her presentation because she's our education specialist, but Stone Laboratory is our island um, outreach education and research facility that's located in the Lake Erie Islands. So maybe some of you have been there, but if you've not been there, it's a really wonderful place and it's just a, a really nice place to visit if you're ever interested, you know, in coming to that part of Ohio. So, I'm gonna talk about bag bans and skip the straw campaigns to see are these types of prevention strategies effective? And so the reason that these items were chosen as a focus is if you remember from Chelsea's presentation, she talked about how bags and straws were some of the top 10 to 15 items that we find on beach cleanups. I'm sure you've probably seen images that have birds entangled in plastic bags. Maybe you've seen the famous straw video about the sea turtle that had a straw in its nose. So these are items of concern because we use them frequently, but then they also cause issues when they get into the natural environment. 
also for us locally here in Cuyahoga County, so that's the county where Cleveland is located, they were looking at a plastic bag ban, and there was a lot of controversy around this bag ban. So we wanted to get some information about what do customers think about policies that seek to reduce plastic bags. Uh, just to let everyone know, at least in our area, there was a temporary pause on the use of reusable bags because of COVID. However, those restrictions have been lifted, but the bag ban that was in place for Cuyahoga County is no longer allowed to be enforced, at least through September by governor order. And then as far as straws, the, the location where we did our straw work was up at Stone Laboratory on South Bass Island. And it's a very popular tourist destination with restaurants and drinking facilities. So straws are a huge um, item of concern up there. So we were trying to work with the restaurants to just use less straws in general. So that's why bags and straws were chosen for our research projects. So like I said, we um, do have some bag ban legislation in Ohio, it is on temporary pause. But if you look at these other states that are in the teal bluish color, these are where there are local government bag bans. If you want more information on bag ban legislation in the United States, I've included some information here to the right. Ohio Sea Grant worked with the National Sea Grant Law Center to do a memo on plastics policies in the United States. So I encourage you that if you want more information, we, we did a webinar on it in the fall of 2020. There's a couple of memos you can read and then the presentations for that webinar are also there. So I'm not gonna talk any more about legislation right now, but you can do some further, further investigation on your own if this is something you're really interested in. Also, we were wanting to look at plastic bags because of the, the recycling limit you know, limitations really for all plastics, but especially plastic bags. So 9% of plastics that are sent will actually be recycled. And this is not just a figure for us locally here in Cuyahoga County. This is a global figure. So we do a really horrible job of recycling plastics and the types of plastics that can actually be recycled in our area in the United States is very limited. So you can actually only put plastic jugs and plastic bottles in your recycling. Now this can change by state, city, country. So if you have questions about recycling in your area, I, I encourage you to reach out either to your solid waste district or to whichever company is going to be hauling your waste away. They will tell you what types of plastics can be recycled. So 9% of plastic sent for recycling, that's a very, very low recycling rate. It's even lower for plastic bags. So for us, we cannot put plastic bags in curbside recycling. When you put plastic bags in curbside recycling, they clog the equipment, which is very expensive for the uh, recycling facility to manage, but they also cause safety issues for those working at the recycling facility. So for us here in Cuyahoga County, we send our bags either to grocery stores or some larger chain stores like Target or Walmart. They actually have plastic film recycling. However, only 1% of those plastic bags actually get recycled. The rest of them are going to landfill. So for us, we're looking at about 7,000 tons of bags are landfilled in Cuyahoga County per year. And that costs taxpayers um, $300,000 a year just to manage these plastic bags. And I really wanna to touch quickly on plastic recycling that there is eventually going to be an end of life for that plastic item. So for example, a plastic water bottle will never become another plastic water bottle. When you heat plastic, the bonds that make that plastic, they eventually break down. So that plastic needs to be made into a thinner and weaker plastic material, whether that be plastic bags or clothing like fleece jackets. So that's why recycling is, is really not the greatest option for plastic items, because first of all, we don't have the infrastructure to manage it, but then there is eventually going to be a period in that plastic items life where the only option for it will be landfill or it could possibly end up in the natural environment. Also, we've seen a collapse of recycling. So when Asian countries stop taking plastic recycling, um, not just from us, but from other countries as well, we, we lost our place to send plastic recycling. And that's why so much of this plastic items are now going to landfill. Also, oil, which is used you know, that's the, the product that's used to make plastic is very 
low. It's very cheap right now. So it's cheaper to make items out of virgin plastic than it is to clean plastics, recycle those plastics, and then make them into another plastic item. So that's why we've seen a, a collapse in recycling for this country. So that's why we were looking at trying to phase out plastics because they either couldn't be recycled or um, we were looking at some legislation surrounding the plastic items. So we did some research on plastic bags. So I'm gonna talk about that right now. So several years ago with funding from the NOAA Marine Debris Program and the Office of Sustainability for the city of Cleveland, we asked people, why don't you use bags? And the majority of people said that they forget to bring bags into the store with them or people were going to use that free plastic bag for something else, whether it was to make art, to line their garbage can, or pick up pet waste. Those were the most common reasons we were being given as to why people were forgetting bags or taking a bag on purpose. And so we thought, well, how do we get people to use their reusable bags? So we partnered um, with the Lake County Solid Waste District, and we went to farmer's markets throughout the summer and we actually gave people free reusable bags to use at the farmer's market or at the grocery store. And this was funded through the NOAA Marine Debris Program and the Lake County Solid Waste District. And what we found is that people were given bags, but they weren't necessarily using them again. So through some survey work, we found out that people were not continuing to reuse these bags. But then when we did observations at the farmer's market uh, post giving people bags, we found that we observed 238 bags out of 1,325 bags being given out. However, only 50 of those bags were observed at markets when we were not giving people free bags. So a very small percentage of people um, were bringing bags back to the farmer's market or using them elsewhere. So the answer is not to give people more bags. Um, the answer is to educate people, offer them reminder strategies, and try to get them to use the bags that they already have. So again, with funding from the No Marine Debris Program, and then in partnership with some local grocery and local clothing stores, we did a lot of education to customers. We educated the staff about the issue of plastic bags. And then we tried to pilot some reminder strategies. So we chose signs. So these signs were placed up in the store. Uh, they were placed up you know, in the doors right as you were walking into the store. And then we also gave away keychains, magnets, and window decals. And what we found is that the reminder items, the magnets, decals, and keychains, they kind of reminded people to bring their own bags, but they really weren't that successful. We found that signs in the parking lot or in the store were more effective at getting people to bring their own bags. However, that only works if people have bags in their car. If you left your bags at home, well, <laughs> the signs wouldn't be very effective. And so, as you can see here, most people said the signs were more effective, but like I said, if you're coming from home and you've left your bags at home, once you get to the grocery store, um, the signs wouldn't be very helpful. And we also looked at the effectiveness of outreach, you know, because we, we think that the way we can change behavior is we just, you know, give people information and we do outreach and then we hope that this changes behavior. Well, when we looked at bag use, as you can see, the bag use didn't really change between the pre-outreach and the post-outreach, we saw just as many plastic bags being used during both occurrences. Then we also wanted to look at, well, what happens when you implement a bag ban? So in January of 2020, a bag ban was implemented in Cleveland. Enforcement was to occur six months later. So they were giving the stores six months to phase out the plastic bags they had and then come up with an alternative, whether there would be no bags offered or they would charge for paper bags. And then throughout that period, they were encouraging people to bring their own bags. And in this initial bag ban implementation, we found that it didn't, it wasn't doing anything. People, plastic bags were still available in the store. People were not bringing in their own bags and there was no enforcement because that enforcement wasn't coming until six months later. Unfortunately, we weren't able to continue with this research because in March, 
uh, stores no longer allowed reusable bags. And like I said earlier, the bag ban for Cuyahoga County has been paused and cannot be enforced through governor order. So we weren't able to get more information, but, but the, you know, really enforcement of a bag ban needs to happen in order for people and stores to abide by whatever is in, in, in the legislation. And lots of times when we, we try to talk about plastics legislation, some people say, well, it's not a good idea. We don't like it. But if, if you look at the research we've done, and we've asked this now over a period of four years, do people support legislation limiting the use of bag bans, whether that is a fee program or a ban? And if you look at the graphs on the left side, you can see that for the most part, the majority of customers are in support of plastics legislation. However, there's still a small percentage, about a quarter, that do not support it. So when you're looking at plastic bag bans or plastic bag fee programs, I think it's really important to send the information to the public and let them hold a vote so that it's an entire community response and it's not just a top-down approach. Also, it's really important to give people time to adjust to any enforcement so that they can get in the habit of bringing their own bags. Also, we wanted to see, well, do people support businesses that they take their own initiative to phase out plastic bags? Because one of the stores we were working with, the owner decided they weren't gonna offer plastic bags anymore and people could either bring in their own bags or hand carry items. And as you can see, people are very supportive of businesses that are going to reduce access to plastic bags. So people are gonna, they're in favor of charging for a bag or banning bags. And when we worked with this business, we did education with the staff, we did education with the customers, and we also sent a survey out to the customers to see what did they think about this store going bagless. And for the most part, 68% of people provided comments or um, opinions that were in support. And they were saying things like, this helps solidify the idea so I might remember to take my bags into other stores. Other people were saying if they're forced to use a reusable bag, they would make the necessary adjustments to do so. It is so easy for us to have access to plastic bags. They're always there in the grocery store and we don't have to pay for them. So there's no consequence if we don't bring in our own bags. However, there were people who were not in support of a bagless business. And for some people, they, they wanted the bag because they're using it for something else or People are, I'm spending money in this store. I at least deserve a bag to carry my items out. So those, those were the main reasons we heard people were not supportive. Then we also spoke to the staff because they're the people who are interacting with the customers every day to get their information about the bagless initiative. And most of the staff said, for the most part, people are fine with it. To be honest, a lot of them said that people didn't really care. And there were a few people who were really enthusiastic. And then there were some people who thought it was a terrible idea. Um, as far as losing any profit or customer base, the store did not identify any financial losses. And as far as encouraging other places to make the adjustment, they said just giving us time and training employees is really important. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Sue and she's gonna talk about our straw work up at South Bass Island. Hi everybody. Um, I'm gonna zip through this quick cause it looks like our time is starting to dwindle down. But for those of you that are not familiar with Putin Bay, um, we're a little village in Ohio. We're located on South Bass Island. Um, there's about 20 little islands located in the Western end of Lake Erie and as Jill said, this village is a real popular uh, summer resort. There's a lot of hotels, bars, restaurants. And so as Jill and I sat and hypothesized about a way to put this grant in into a working um, type setting, Putin Bay seemed to be the answer. We work with students, we work with educators, but who works with tourists? And so the name of our grant is Talking with Our Tourists, a Marine Debris Awareness Initiative. I am an educator. I've been in the classroom for 30 plus years. And for the person that reached out with the question, how do you keep up your motivation? How do you keep from becoming upset that we're not making a difference education? 
I get excited every time we have an opportunity to work with students, to talk to a tourist, to work with our um, bartenders and waitresses in our restaurants. Um, people are excited. They want to make a difference. We are making a difference. And so I'm excited by this grant, whereas Jill is our great resource from a research standpoint. I'm more that boots on the ground. I'm more getting excited about the education perspective and getting out and interacting with our public. And I still see that as such a positive way to try to get our message out. And if you look at this slide, it shows that we work with a lot of our island partners um, from our transportation people to our restaurants. We actually have a national park. Um, there's a, a nature center that sits on the island. Um, our park districts. One of our state partners is Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, who is involved with Congressional District 9 that runs all along our Lake Erie coastline. We have our boating partners, um, our taxi services, our tour trams, and then Stone Lab itself. If you're not familiar with Stone Lab, we're big. Uh, Jill showed the slide in the beginning. Um, we work with lots and lots of students on lots and lots of projects, not only from an education perspective, but an outreach and a research perspective as well. And so we're very unique. We were gifted, uh, Gibraltar Island was gifted to us in 1925. And so we've been doing this education and outreach perspective since that time. Marine debris is new um, on the, and I shouldn't say new, it's a problem that exists, but we're really starting to hit it hard. Uh, Stone Lab is doing what they can to try to get that uh, aspect of education out. And our marine debris um, initiative here, our grant, which we is a NOAA marine debris grant, allows us to be able to get that message out to our students. Um, one of the interesting things, and I'll just quickly, you can read this slide yourself, but when we started this uh, particular initiative to, to try to reduce the number of straws and to educate our staff, at our restaurants, um, and, and that's an important piece. We educate our staff so that we're not just making a standard remark about we're saving a sea turtle. We want them to actually understand the issue, to understand the changes that need to be made and why. And so if you look, we started this campaign working with focus groups and educating um, our boardwalk staff and working with our restaurants. We had no campaign in 2016. Um, in 2017, we stopped really putting the straws in the drinks. You can see the, the decrease. 2018, we officially started to skip the straw campaign. You can see the, the decrease again. And then in 2019, Sea Grant joined the project. And you can look at the numbers. Um, again, we're, we were down quite a bit. So we had a reduction of 108,400 straws in two years. So we are making a difference. We are educating, we are motivating. Um, we have focus groups with our um, employees at the restaurants and you can see the customer response. When we sit with our waiter, waiters and waitresses, they're overwhelmed by the positive response. Um, people who are requesting straws often change their mind when the staff actually can talk to them in, a, in an educated manner as to why we're skipping the straws. And our restaurants haven't really lost business. The staff aren't losing tips. You occasionally get some negativity. Um, we understand that you can't take straws totally out of the picture in a restaurant setting. Uh, there are people with disabilities that still need that straw. A lot of people though are starting to carry their own. And you can see the sign up in the right hand corner of this slide that actually shows the tabletop messaging that we have going on to try to help people understand what we're doing and why we're doing it if they don't actively chat with our servers. So some outreach and education that's taking place. Um, we have several initiatives going on. One is our trash tote that we have created. Um, there's contact information. Um, it's a variety of projects or excuse me, a variety of supplies that help an educator just open the bag up and be able to interact with a group talking about alternatives, showing examples of marine debris. Um, we're providing different means by which to pick it up with. In other words, we've beach cleanup supplies are in there. And then we have a series of cards that give a lot of good information. So it's it's like a 
it's an actual trash tote that's a walking lesson bag that helps any educator in any setting be able to help educate people, whether it's a student, whether it's a tourist, whether it's a, a, an informal setting, a formal setting. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the trash trunks, this is a trunk that was put out, not, we, we were a partner, but it was put out by a variety of Sea Grant, um, more of the Great Lakes Sea Grants, I guess. And if you are in the United States, you have the opportunity of reaching out to Sarah Orlando, Jill, or myself um, to borrow this trunk. So this is a little bit more formal. Um, it's actually got an educator guide with lessons where our trash tote just allows you to kind of run the informal lesson without a, a lesson plan. Another thing that we've done is we have, um, it's called a marine debris art contest this year. Usually it's a PSA, a public service announcement, a public service announcement that we do with students in grades nine through 12. It's NOAA, our Great Lake representative, Ohio Sea Grant and Congressional District 9. And Marcy Captor very much backs this. The kids were making public service announcements and making lessons geared toward marine debris, which actively put them out to do a beach cleanup or be involved in a lesson and then make a 30 second to a minute PSA that tells people about the issue. And we put those kids in a setting where those PSAs were um, put shown at Cedar Point. And you can see some recognition here at Cedar Point. This is uh, three of our kids and their teachers who won on years coming. Um, of course, we couldn't do it last year because of you know the situation that we're in. But this is great. This involves a lot of kids. This year, we, um, we took it down to grades 6 through 12, and it's more of an art contest, um, which is allowing kids to use uh, marine debris to create clean marine debris, I should say, to create some messaging uh, based around Cedar Point's anniversary this year. So they're creating Cedar Point exhibits or rides made from plastic pollution. And then they talk a little bit about what they've collected and why they've chosen this and the direction that they're going to go with helping educate others um, to the problem. Uh, no Marine Debris Program actually has an art, art contest every year. Um, and so you can see the website down below to get your students involved in that as well. Cleanups, that's always a great one. I love beach cleanups. It's a great way to interact with people, to teach, to learn, to help them understand. Um, these are three of the big ones, uh, Alliance for the Great Lakes. The Great Canadian would be a Canadian, um, more Canadian based. The Alliance for the Great Lakes is the United States. An international coastal cleanup involves um, the Ocean Conservancy. So what can you do? And these cards are in our trash totes. Uh, I saw somebody posted a question about the three R's. We actually have um, eight. We said uh, rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, refurbish, repair, repurpose. And the very last option, as Jill said, is to recycle because only 9% of the majority of our recyclables get recycled. We also have a card, 10 things you can do. You can can it, use a trash can with a lid, <clears throat> tap it, drink tap water from a reusable bottle, stow it, prevent items from blowing into the lake by storing them properly, um, butt in, tell others about the impact, I always like that, butt in, tell the others about the impacts of marine debris, remove it, participate in a cleanup, Butt out, use an ashtray. A lot of people don't realize that butts are plastic pollution as well. So we uh, really try to reinforce that plastic pollution, uh, butts are plastic pollution. Um, we tell people to refuse it. I mean, you can refuse certain items and bring your own. If you're at a restaurant, you wanna bring your leftovers back, take your own container. Um, we talk about reusing it, bringing your own grocery bag, Reinvent it, ask companies to optimize their packaging and create lake friendly materials. I have conversations with restaurants a lot when I'm in there and oftentimes they just look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about or why are you bothering with us, us with this particular topic, but to me it was important to share. 
um, 10 and then again, go that extra mile, sort, separate, recycle, but that is one of our last options. Um, but there are things that you can do. And again, I get excited from the education standpoint. Don't ever, don't ever feel like you're not making difference. You are share, educate, let those kids get involved, help our new generation of learners and our old generations of learners. It's always good to learn new things. So hopefully you've, uh, I'm sorry if I went quickly, but we were trying to get this to a point where we're not keeping you too far and you have some time for questions. Thank you so much, Sue. That was wonderful. And I'm sorry, I did go a little bit longer than we had practiced. So, Sue, if you don't mind turning your video on and unmuting yourself, we're going to look through the chat. So, Christina, I don't know if there was any questions that jumped out, but we would like to try to answer. Yes, I actually emailed you a Word document with the questions that I saw <laughs> during your presentation. Um, one of the big things that people were asking about was clarification on the plastic bag recycling in, in grocery stores. I think people weren't sure if you were talking about 1% of all plastic bags being recycled or 1% of the ones that are going back to the grocery store being recycled. That was one big concern that I saw. Uh, yes, thank you. And I, I'm sorry if I wasn't more clear, but yes, it is 1% of plastic bags being recycled um, that go to the grocery store facility. Because if a plastic bag does not go to a plastic film or grocery store, you know, where you drop them off in the bin, then it's going to landfill. So 1% of plastic bags that go for recycling at a plastic film facility will actually be recycled. So that's a very low number because a lot of people don't take their plastic bags to those places because it's an extra trip for them. So it's something extra that they have to do. All right, I'm looking through the questions now. Um, And maybe oh, there's, we'll a, do, there's we'll a question about the, there's a question about the drinking straws in the juice box. Is that an efficient way to discard them? Oh, you, you put know, the, the straw. Juice in, juice I see you what put the straws down in. Is that an efficient way to get rid of those straws? Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. So. Unfortunately, like I said, a lot of these plastic items have to go to landfill. So when you can either cut up items, so for example, anything circular, whether it's a hair tie, a rubber band, those six pack rings, now disposable masks, um, anything circular like a yogurt carton, if you can cut those things in half, if that item does get into the natural environment, it will be less likely to harm an animal. So same thing with straws. If you can actually cut the straws in half, that is the best way to dispose of a straw because then it wouldn't, an, an organism wouldn't be able to get entangled inside of it or it wouldn't be as likely to get stuck in an organism. So that's a great question. So the question is, um, again, with the bags, do they throw them out at the store after we put them in the recycle bin? So um, that is a high possibility, yes. There are many stores that say they recycle items, and then if you actually check their bins in the back, the items they say they're recycling are actually going to landfill, um, or if those items get to a recycling center and there's contamination because items in there are dirty or there are, are plastic items that should not be included in that, they will send it to landfill. So for example, when you send, an, send a batch of items to a recycling facility, if there is 1% contamination, so the contamination can be there's food items, um, food waste or anything like that, or there are items in there that cannot be recycled, that load of recycled items will get sent to landfill because it is cheaper to send it to landfill than to pay someone or risk someone's health 
to go through either dirty items or items that are not appropriate for recycling. So that's why when we talk about recycling, we really say it is not the best option because recycling changes every day based on the value of plastics and what those plastics can be used for. Also, you are putting the entire responsibility on the individual to stay up to date with what can and cannot be recycled. So that's why we're talking about either phasing these items out of your life or industry, we're now having conversations with industry at the federal level, federal level um, to do what's called extended uh, producer responsibility and basically making these plastics companies responsible for the plastic items that they're putting out there on the market. Um, are there any other questions that I did not answer? You can go ahead and type those in the chat. All right, well, I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, please feel free to reach out to Sue and I or Chelsea if you have further questions. We just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I wanna say thank you to Sue, thank you to Christina, and thank you to Chelsea for putting this webinar together. Thank you, Christina, for handling the logistical aspect of this webinar. And thank you to all of you for joining us here on a Friday afternoon. You should be receiving an email, hopefully within the next week or two, that will include the PowerPoint slides and the recording, as well as a evaluation survey, just to let us know how we did on this webinar and, and things that we, we might need to improve upon. So with that, we're just gonna say thank you to everyone. We appreciate you for being here and we just hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the weather. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you.